Mystery Project. I'm Hannah Nordhaus, and I'm interviewing Alice and Tom Brace. They're both Braces, right? Ron. Oh, Ron. I'm sorry. Ron Brace. My apologies. Start all over again. I'm interviewing Alice and Ron Brace, um, and it is the 20th of August, 2004, and we're at Alice and Ron's house in Lakewood. And um, to begin, and this is my first interview I've done with two people, so uh, I guess why don't you guys sort of tell me together your story of how you ended up at Rocky Flats. Okay. Before we were at Rocky Flats, Ron and I owned ADCO Fire Protection, mm -hmm. and we were a contractor for EG&G. We did uh, the fire extinguishers, CO2 systems, halon systems work that the site itself did not do. They called us one time and asked us if we knew of any employees who would like to come and work in the Fire Prevention Bureau that was going to be expanded. And eventually we were the two employees that they hired to and, do that. And what was the Fire Prevention Bureau? Ron, do you want it? It was a division of the Rocky Flats Fire Department and being as we were a contractor and familiar with the site policies and procedures and their equipment, it made a natural transition for us to come work for Rocky Flats. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had a company out of state that wanted to purchase our company. So we were able to sell our company and go to work for Rocky Flats. So you were working then quite a bit on site before you came actually to... Correct. That's correct. Place. And so how long were you doing that? About two, three years. That was in the mid '80s. What year? Mm -hmm. Late '80s, yeah. Late '80s. And um, what exactly did you do as a contractor then? We uh, serviced and designed fire protection systems, what they call special hazard systems, for the restaurants, uh, for the emergency generators, um, various other locations on site. And mm -hmm. so, when you came to Rocky Flats, was the work exactly the same? Pretty much so. It expanded a little bit to include the portable fire extinguishers, uh, but pretty much the same. Uh, we began to implement uh, uh, procedures, formalized procedures. We uh, began a program of inventory and site-wide tracking of uh, the portable fire extinguishers and fire extinguishing systems. Began a PMO program PMO. Preventive maintenance <laughs> pro program for the, for the yeah. equipment, and uh, so we formalized everything, and then became responsible for that, and then uh, designed anything new that needed to, to to be designed that came on site. And we had to do some learning too because we specialized in hood and duct systems, halon systems, fire extinguishers really didn't get into the sprinkler systems and that sort of thing. So we had to do some learning and learn how to do the preventive maintenance on sprinkler systems and a few other systems that Rocky Flats had that we did not do anything with before with our company. Hmm. Was that a difficult learning curve? Or? No. It was fun. It was, it was yeah. real interesting on there. Who trained you? How did, was there someone there before you doing it? Or? Fire yeah. protection engineers mm -hmm. were brought in to do some of the training. Mm -hmm. and a lot of it was our own study and uh, reading manuals, talking with that other expertise. So you're maintaining mm. the sprinkler systems and the at fire that, extinguishers. You're just basically making sure they work. At mm -hmm. that time, yes. So conducting yeah. tests. Uh huh. So this means that you were all over the place, right? Yes. That's correct. <laughs> every building, every room. Wow. Well, you we hit the mother load with you guys then. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I guess first to start, what, why did they need, they didn't have your position before as a sort of formalized thing. What, was there a new push towards fire safety at that time? or They were more or less expanding. They did it before, mm -hmm. but uh, the firefighters were the ones that were responsible for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they increased the number of prevention personnel. And so they wanted to specialize and have someone who did those inspections continuously. Mm -hmm. So they were familiar with them, you know, very familiar with them, and also repairing and, and taking care of them. So it was just an expansion, expansion of the fire department. 
dedicated towards the inspection rather than also being firefighters that responded to emergency calls as far as EMS or, or fire or whatever it was. Did you get any sense of why this change in philosophy at that point in time? There seemed to be a site-wide emphasis to bring all necessary skills used on site in-house and use less subcontracting. So I think it was a site-wide uh, philosophy of bringing everything in-house. Okay, so not so much a safety thing as a sort of uh, management thing. Correct. I think so. Okay, so um, maybe you can tell me now um, what, well, I guess the first time you set foot in Rocky Flats was it when you were still subcontractors. And t just tell me what it was like. I, I guess what you knew about Rocky Flats before going there and then what the experience what, of being there was like. You're going to have to handle that because I never got past the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it was... Um, a great learning experience. Uh, we would come on as a, as a subcontractor. We would work with uh, someone through the fire department, and they would escort us around. Uh, I had not been exposed to detailed vehicle searches previously. I had not uh, ever been exposed to the detail level of entering pr protected areas and being escorted. Uh, so it was at first kind of intimidating, but uh, and very time consuming. Mm -hmm. But uh, once we got through the security okay. procedures and actually performing my responsibilities and inspections and installations and so forth, it was pretty much routine. But it was pretty intimidating with that much security uh, constantly watching over you. Had you been in such an industrial environment before? I'd been in private security before, so I was used to having uh, private security personnel, security officers, uh, uh, gate passes and so forth, but not to the level, uh, to the extent that we had at Rocky Flats. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the armament, uh, the weapons, um, I remember the first time entering the protected zone, uh, security was performing a, a drill and exercise and they had their armored vehicles pull up next to me and uh, you know I was very intimidated at that time because I was the subject of the drill and didn't know it <laughs> and so forth. So uh, the extent of it was, was very unique and kind of exciting once you calm down. As far as industrial things, that was not really a big change for us because when you inspect fire extinguishers as, as a business, you go into all kinds of businesses and you go into every room and, you know, of, of the building and so you see a lot of different manufacturing and industrial types of situations. So yes, Rocky Flats was unique, but it was similar to other industrial manufacturing types of situations too, so that was not so much surprising where the security was very intense compared to some of the other locations we'd been in. And Alice, why didn't you get past the gate the first time? Well, I didn't do a lot of services on the systems and that sort of thing. I was more office personnel and then I did uh, fire extinguishers. And so I really didn't go to the you know plant much at all unless I just need to deliver something. And it would be a handoff to a firefighter and that was all I would ever do. So did you guys have to get um, clearance then? When not, not initially. Uh -huh. Initially it was uh, a contractor's visitor's badge and being closely escorted. Okay. When we are, were hired as employees for the facility, then yes, we had the, the acute clearance. What was that process like? For us it was pretty easy because they do a background search and it was kind of hard for them because they would come and they'd ask Ron, they wanted to talk to Ron's boss, that was me. And for many of the years that we worked together and then they'd want to talk to my boss and for many of the years Ron was my boss. And then they said, well we need to talk to somebody who was both of your bosses and that was Ron's father. <laughs> and so, you know, our, our background was so closely knit between family and business they really didn't have to go very far to do a research, you know, to go back. You know, we're, we're Colorado natives, 
and to this area, so the background was short-lived and not a lot of detail they had to go back through. So this was a family business? That uh-huh. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, so what did you think about Rocky Flats before you started working there? Obviously, this was the 80s, so there was, it was in the news a lot. Um, had you ever been on a, a nuclear weapons plant? Thought about that. I'd never been on a plant like that. I'd been on Fort Carson a lot, mm -hmm. on a military site. So, so you know, I, I anticipated it to be much like Fort Carson, and in in many ways it was. Uh, the buildings were definitely government buildings, and and that sort of thing. I was not really aware what you know. I'd heard the demonstrations and seen them on TV and that sort of thing was really not that familiar with Rocky Flats and it was quite interesting when we decided to do it together on there. It, it was very very nice to be able to work together and apply our expertise. Rocky Flats was much larger than I had expected it yeah. to be and it was much more self-contained. I mean it's a city by itself and I had not realized that and I had not realized the extensive uh, type expertise of the, the scientists as well as engineers as well as the crafts personnel. The number of people that were on site was a surprise to me. In the redundancy of systems everything was backed up mm -hmm. on there. But so we re really enjoyed learning the site. I mean, it took a long time to learn where every building was and the nuances of every building and the procedures that you had to follow that were different from one building to the next. But that, that made it exciting, made it, made it challenging and interesting. Well, maybe we can talk about um, the buildings now. Okay. Um, okay. One, one thing that struck me is that um, each building seems to have its own culture. So uh, I'm wondering if you could just sort of describe each of the, I mean, obviously I there are hundreds, but the, the major manufacturing facilities, research facilities, and, um, and how the buildings, you know, were different architecturally and culturally and, and all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, there were great differences. The buildings were um, designed specifically for what they were production, type of production, type of assembly. Mm -hmm. What uh, uh, It was interesting for me to learn that basically it was a facility that was designed for research and testing as well as manufacturing. The manufacturing is predominantly um, machining, metal types of fabrication. So depending upon the, the building, they had different types of manufacturing processes. Mm -hmm. In terms of culture between the buildings, um, the, when we arrived there was a strong history both of the individuals working together People were very dedicated to their jobs, they were very dedicated to the site and to the mission, and very pro-government. And as a result, uh, they took great pride in their small part. In that, We all took great pride. So that was evident throughout, and that was consistent throughout the site, was the pride and dedication to doing a job well. Um, at the same time, there was some uniqueness between buildings. Uh, some buildings were more orientated towards scientists, and so there was a little bit different type of culture there. Some buildings were predominantly administrative. Some buildings were, would have production, but the production might be state-of-the-art type, so they were, they were doing things production-wise that weren't done in, in, out in the public industries. Other buildings, uh, it was more traditional type of manufacturing and so forth. So there was, there was a little bit different culture, but the, the spirit decor was always there throughout. Very much pride in what they were doing, mm -hmm. and you know, you would stop it because I had not witnessed this type of production before. And you'd go into an area, and they, you'd say, "Well, what are you doing?" And they would take good time to you know stop and show you what they were doing 
and explaining their equipment and that sort of thing because it was very, um, very sophisticated equipment. And I had no clue what it was. And everyone was very proud of what they were doing. It was great teamwork on it. It was not just me doing this one item. It was we're, we're doing uh, something together for the country. There's a can-do can attitude, uh, you know, so that uh, if something was asked of them that maybe had not been done before or experimented with, it took a team effort. Uh, yes, we can come up with a way to do that. Or we don't know how we'll do it, but we'll... We'll, we'll design one. We'll design one <laughs> there. to manufacture this and manufacture that. Yeah. So, and it was all, you know, it was... The jobs, when we first got there, I remember that I'm one of those go-getter types of people, and we had our own little building for recharging fire extinguishers. And it was called the swamp because it would always, you know, fill up with water at the, in the spring and the summer. And the drains would, uh, would plug, plug up. So someone left a shovel, and it was the wrong kind of shovel. Being a farmer, I knew it was wrong. But I decided to dig a ditch to, uh, uh, to drain, the drain the water away from it. Well, that was a union person's job. And I got into some trouble for doing that on there. And basically what they did was they paid the union the wages for me doing it on there. And it was a new, you know, all new to me that, gee, you couldn't do this because this was a union job. You could do your narrow job, but there was like hanging the fire extinguisher bracket, which we'd done continuously. I couldn't do that because I, it was not my job. You had to go to a union person to hang that bracket and tell him how you want it hung. So there was some learning to do there that everybody had their job and you uh, worked within the guidelines. Was that frustrating? In some cases it was because the ditch needed to be dug now. Mm -hmm. I was there, the shovel was there, it didn't take me a half hour, you know, but it made people mad on it. So it I wasn't trying to take from the job, I was trying to solve the problem at the time. Right. And so it, it, took, it took a while to get used to. Did somebody notice there. you doing it? Or? Yeah. yeah. And called, on, called, yes. in. called the union rep the union and rep. said, they're <laughs> and doing our work. So you came and got, did you get yelled at or did you get a letter of censure or something? Or? I got counseled because I, yeah, I was pretty new. I'd only been on the site maybe you know, three or four weeks, well, uh, probably a month or two because it was spring on it yeah so it, it was all new to me on it yeah it sounds like the union had a lot of power there the union was influential very was. much so and uh very protective of their jobs and we'd come from a non-union environment and uh so we were used to coming in and if extinction needed to be serviced or hung we or bracket need to be resecured or we would do that and had to learn that there are other ways to accomplish that and that you, you cannot tread on other people's uh, turf. Did you, did you get used to it? Oh yes. Oh yeah. Once we learned that. It, it was just, you know, learning the rules. Yeah. That was a lot different than what we had and, you know, of course all of them became our friends eventually because eventually I was in the fire department as a training officer and I did a lot of the training of the, you know, all of the different, the pipe fitters, the electricians, all that sort of thing. And, you know, when you train the same people year after year, they become your friends, you know. And so they all became our friends. We just had to learn the rules. And, you know, part of that learning curve is we'd go to a union person and say, I want to do this. Is that something I can do or does that have to be a union craft to do it? He said, no, it has to be a union craft. We'd say, fine, okay. We'd follow the procedures and have the union craft do it. Or, no, you can do that without infringing on our, our rights. And we'd go do it. So it was a cooperation once we learned that you had to take a desk, ask that extra question, mm -hmm. and so forth. Hmm. Some of the buildings that uh, you were asking that, that was different is it's very rare that when we went industrial that we had to track things that were underground 
on there and trying to come up with our system to do sub basements and basements and, and that sort of thing was a new way to think of things because we always thought of buildings going up and in this case, in many of the cases, the buildings went down and you had to change the way you looked at things on there. How did you, how did you have to change that? Oh, no. Basically it was coming up with a, a numbering system, defecation system that um, would allow us to be able to know where our fire extinguishers, for example, were located if they were on what floor mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. So it was just um, a little bit of a, just a different way of looking at it, a different way of tracking it. It was nothing difficult. It was just just, just different. Unusual. We had a problem had to solve it. Mm. And I guess the other, you would have to, in terms of training for fires and evacuation and stuff, it would, I don't know, I always think smoke goes up and you usually evacuate down, but in this case, you're going up with the smoke. I don't know if mm. that was well, a factor. The, the uniqueness from a fire fighting perspective is that in a traditional fire setting, you want to ventilate. But because of the nature of our business out there, you cannot ventilate the building, ventilate the smoke out to the, to the atmosphere. So there are, there's uniqueness in terms of how to uh, fight a fire, how to contain and so forth. Mm -hmm. In terms of the fire brigade concept, or in Rocky Flats case, best team, um, becomes much more important in, at Rocky Flats than in an industrial setting and there's greater numbers, uh, greater reliance on the best team than you'd have in an industrial setting. Also a greater reliance of having your own fire department mm -hmm. with very, very highly skilled personnel that know how to deal with uh, radiological type fires and how to implement concepts of fire prevention, mm -hmm. which were you know implemented after the 69 fire. So, um, it, it's m much more orientated towards safety, uh, personnel safety as well as fire safety than most industrial settings are. They were also very good about doing evacuation drills mm -hmm. and it was a requirement to have at least one evacuation drill a year for each of the buildings and to make sure that evacuations were done properly and accountability was done. So, you know, they were timed and they had a, a goal to meet and everyone practiced it and it was real important for that on there. Um, back to the smoke ventilation, where, did, where would they ventilate the smoke then? You, you, do, you would ventilate it through your plenums. So you became very coordinated with your stationary operating engineers, SOEs, and, and the facility managers because they might have to increase uh, the ventilation speeds of the fans and so forth to be able to handle the additional smoke removal and so forth run it through your your plenums. You didn't so. want to cut a hole in the roof right. on that because we didn't want anything to go to downtown Denver. Right. So and then the firefighters had to know how you know we didn't have a fire after 69 but they knew how to put them out quickly so they didn't have heat build up and that sort of thing and stress that you'd have to worry about if you were on the outside fire department. You know, and then you're, you're fighting a material that you can't fight in a normal way because uh, the 69 fire was the fire that proved that you could use water mm -hmm. on, on a metal fire. Up until that time, no one had done that before. And, you know, it was um, quite a worry on it. And they just did it out of Desperation, right? And, and six yeah. Technically, that's what happened. It was out of desperation. They they were down to their last thing, and they had to had to do something. And so they uh, were using chemical. Jefferson decided that he was going to do it, and it was and did a good job. Rocky Flats knew how to produce their product, but there are a lot of tangent issues that there was not funding for to research, or people had not believe there would be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with waste is one example, you know, how to process the waste. Uh, there was not funding to, to develop and no good way to really develop 
process. Fire protection was another aspect. There had not been a lot, great deal of research that was formalized that could be put into standard operating procedures of how to suppress certain types of fires. So it was best, um, best effort in some cases. Uh, and uh, a lot of things following the 69 fire then were formalized, were learned that complex wise, DOE complex wise, that were applied so that fire prevention really became a, a much higher level of expertise, a much higher level of funding uh, DOE wide uh, so that we wouldn't have a repeat of that type of occurrence again. And it was more towards the type of operation where before if you're a firefighter in downtown Denver you could be a firefighter at the Rocky Flats because they didn't worry about nuclear firefighting and it became after the 69 fire kind of a specialization on there and now you know what was it uh, well, it would have been in 2002-2003 all of our firefighters went out and did training for all of the local firefighters just on how to handle nuclear fires and radiological because of the worry after 2001, after September 11th on there. Because all of a sudden, gee, we're shipping things through, now we're worried, what, what are we worried about? And so we did quite a little bit of training with all of the local departments on there, trying to get them to feel more at ease and know that there is a difference on how to fight the fire. So how do you fight a nuclear fire differently? On there. I don't know the best way to respond to that. Um, you just, you need to realize that uh, the ca contamination and how to protect yourself with PPE and that water does work, but it takes a lot of it. And the uh, trying to keep it contained and keep the flow more like a hazmat. Is, is the way you're working with it. What's a PPE? Personal protective equipment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so so now now they do have they have big tanks of water for fighting fires then rather than the chemicals they had before or they have both. It's a combination. Yeah. All of the above. Yeah. Came back to your question of the uniqueness of the buildings. Um, the the buildings were built at different times. For different purposes and it became really enjoyable to talk with the people in the various buildings about the history because most people had been there many many years and uh, there was not a lot of movement of people between buildings so you could go in and talk to people about when this building was first built or you know how, how was it different now than it was then as technology or as the product changed and so forth and as science um, improved as to how to deal with uh, waste or how to handle it, the technology. So it was a lot of fun with the cultures there. So um, was there a building or a room that you liked to visit or one like to avoid visiting? <laughs> 881 was uh, a building that was a challenge and they had a group of rooms that there was only one way into that room and to go up or down several floors and only one one way out. It was a challenge for fire prevention because if you had to evacuate those rooms. Also in fires usually things are nice and black and you can't see where you're going and you had to remember to get to that one group of rooms there was only one way in and one way out. And you had to know where it was and how to get to it. I was given a challenge. I was a coordinator for the building emergency support team and that building was noted for getting everybody lost. You know, that unless you worked in that building, you were not able to get around and find things. And I was given the challenge to, I had several extinguishers that I had to take out of the building. And they told me there would be no way I could find those extinguishers and get them out to the dock. And so I was kind of proud of myself that I found all the extinguishers I need to find without their help and got them out. It's like a scavenger hunt. And they were... <laughs> They were real surprised that I could remember where I'd been in the building and that I could get, you know, could get to it. But it, it was a very difficult building to learn and to get around in. Do you know why it was designed that way? 
security. And that 880, that was one of the real early ones, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the under, one of the underground. Uh-huh. So the steps were down from the ground level. Right. The, and it was built uh, on the side of a mountain. So if you went in from the other side, you entered from uh, a, a ground level. But if you entered from one side, then you had to go down to go to the floors. Okay. So it depended on where you entered the building. And so there was a level, large level of security at that entrance as well? Is that, or is yeah, they had, it, was, it was secured. Yeah. Was that, a, they, that wasn't a... That wasn't they did some research and things like that, that mm -hmm. when we were there, out of that building on it. It was a manufacturing it, building at one time. And then it had the uh, computer systems for payroll and, and all of that, uh, the documentation and that sort of thing. So it was like a real Cold War bunker then? Huh? Yeah. I enjoyed building 460 a great deal because of the machinery in the high bay and the uh, technology that was being used to manufacture their components. Um, it was all state-of-the-art, uh, advanced for what the industry was using co that would be com considered comparable. Mm -hmm. It was a bright building that was uh, very well lit, and new types of machinery, open space. So I liked 460. Is that a newer one? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the building that I liked the least was 76, 77 just because it was so spread out and so many modules and um, it was just difficult to, for me to to follow my way through that building in, a, in an easy way. I could get I from could one lose end, it any time. <laughs> I could uh, get from one end to the next with no problem but it may not be the, the quickest, the fastest, most direct way but uh, yeah I would have loved to have been there during production to see all the activity and see how well those folks did their jobs. It would have been fascinating. I never realized in 76, 77 how much it was one of the buildings we could get Ron turned around in really easy. But you knew where you were by what glove box was there. And I went back um, before I left and all of the glove boxes were gone. And that's when I got lost because it was one big open space. There was no glove boxes to let you know where you were. So is it a big, is it, was it a warren of rooms or it was just a big open sort of warehouse space but you couldn't see from one end to the next? You couldn't see from one end to the other end. And you knew there was, glove boxes were interconnected so it, it did its production. Mm -hmm. And you know, with the glove boxes gone, it was just a big open vacant room. Yeah. Or, really several rooms mm -hmm. on it and it was it was it was at that time that I couldn't tell when I had gone in through 76 I was not aware that I'd walked through 76 into 77 until I happened to run into the women's locker room mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, oh gee is this where I am on it yeah. how could you tell um were the bo glove boxes different enough that you could say, oh, I'm at this glove box here? Or yeah, what, what happened in the glove boxes would let you know where you were so on this. Uh, solutions or, or the equipment that was inside them, okay. on it. Interesting. Uh, Any so, other... Uh, oh, and what did they do in 460? They were a uh, machining type of facility mm -hmm. where they would uh, manufacture very parts through, through the machining process, through the welding process, mm -hmm. and testing. Lay, they used a lot of lays to, to make tools, tools and dies and, and that sort of thing for the production. They made the tools that they needed to use for production. And so, you know, like we said, Rocky Flats was self-contained. Everything was made for their own use. Mm -hmm. You know, and these guys were phenomenal. You'd say, you'd need something, and they'd say, oh, I can make that. You know, and it was no thought to it all. They just knew how to do it. And they were very, very proud of their work and how they did it. Uh. So um, when you went into buildings 776 and 77, did you, ha did you have to be in supplied air in parts of in certain rooms? Or? <laughs> respirators predominantly. Predominantly respirators. There was 
several events that we responded on as firefighters that we had to be in supply air, but that was a firefighter response. And any time you responded, you you responded in supply air. We didn't, you know, we didn't work in bubble suits at all mm -hmm. on there, uh, the premier system at all. Any time any work we did, pretty much uh, we had RCT support, radio control technician support <laughs> control. <laughs> on there, and. Uh, did you know we would dress out from whatever the dress out procedure for that area was and respirators and so mostly we had uh, APR respirators so, you know APR. yes APRs are respirators that filter the ambient air okay. uh, did, and did you have to put on um, smocks yeah we sometimes we had smocks uh, in the brilliant area we had smocks we had canary suits we had gray coveralls you know, with some areas you know um, pretty, real, pretty much whatever was dictated by policy and, and i sees every area was different mm -hmm. and so you know when we would set up the date that we were going to go in and do whatever you know building it was we would ask, you, you had to get a uh, work control number, and we would find out on that permit what we had to wear for, for that, that job. And it would tell you if you needed a respirator, how many pairs of gloves you needed, you know, uh, if you had to have double NICs, or if you could work in uh, uh, gray work, you know, jumpsuits, or whatever it was. And so you knew from your work control what what you had to wear for that job. And did they had it for you there? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to bring it. No, you, you dress out there. The fire department had lockers in each of the major buildings. And, you know, you'd, you'd switch out of your fire department uniform into whatever the building was wearing mm -hmm. and dress out as you need to dress out for them. And in the case when there was a call, did it work that way if you, had, if you were responding to a... In most of our calls, we went in in our bunker gear, mm -hmm. and you know, there's was times we lost our gear because it was hot, but uh, we responded as we were, and then we had to have to come out on there, and then the RCTs would scan us out to make sure that we were clean and you know that sort of not. If not, they would keep whatever was hot, <laughs> and we'd lose it, and we'd have to have it replaced. So were you mostly responding to spills then, or um, you said there weren't any fires after six? Months. Well, you'd have little small fires, or you'd have something that would uh, spill uh, patients that would, you know, need help. So emergent, you know, EMS, medical type situations. Yeah. All right. So did either of you, did you ever get contaminated? I got contaminated once. But very, it was just surface contamination on my anti seas. I don't know uh, if you've ever been contaminated. I just was contaminated once out of 771, and they kept the slacks, and I got to wear DOE stuff until I got back to the fire department and could change. And you on had a, to take off your anti seas? Mm -hmm. um, I only had to do the buffalo, you know, the boxer short shuffle once, and I think that was all in fun and play. I don't think I was really hot, but it was a game that some of the RCTs would play. What's the, yeah, on the, <laughs> you what it is. Basically, you dress down and all you're, you've got is a t-shirt and boxer, boxer shorts, and you have to go back to the dressing room to get dressed. And it was kind of a game they played on there. And it's, you know, once you, you, you felt like you were accepted if you it's had... an initiation. <laughs> on there. They could the, tell what you were new and... Which, if you knew something or if you didn't, on there. So you wouldn't necessarily be contaminated, they just sort of... They just told you you like were, <laughs> on there. And what were the instances where you were contaminated? You said you were in 771, mm -hmm. just, and you just walked through a room and then... I was, I was trying to come out and they told me I was hot and before I was all done I was down to a t-shirt and... And women, the women we've always dressed out in double, as far as the fire department went, double boxer shorts. You know, so you were very well protected. 
And from there, once they got you that far, you just walked back to the locker room and, you know, dressed out like you were supposed to. Everybody's staring so, at you. Everybody's staring at you, and you're just Maybe walking through. Hollering. You're you're walking through the halls with t-shirts and you know boxer shorts on it. So that's why you yes. wear the double boxer shorts. Right. So you don't have to you know, we were, you know, the fire department was pretty cool about telling you some of the jokes so you were prepared for some of the things when you went in there. So it was not a big surprise, but you wondered if it was going to happen to you or not. But you kind of felt like you were accepted once it did, you know. On it. Cat calls too? Not a whole lot. <laughs> You know, it's, it got to the point, I, I know Ron would agree with me, that the radiological technicians, you know, I trusted many of them, that, you know, I wouldn't do anything unless they said it was okay. And I really trusted their expertise, and they, they were good. They, they knew what they were doing. They kept us safe. And, you know, the ones, I, I still teach one day a month out there for the uh, building emergency support team. I would still trust those people. They had yeah. your best interest in, at heart. Yeah, they could play, but they were still t protecting you. So when you went from room to room, did you always have a RCT with you? Depends Most of the time. On, depends on what we were what we were doing that day. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in a hot building, most cases we did, but there were there were times depending on what we were doing that uh, we, we would work independently, mm -hmm. but we'd always be uh, checked before we would leave. An area, so uh, um, contamination would not spread. Yeah. So there was never a problem in that way. The only time I was scared was in 883. The RCT let me in, and the building at this time the building was not occupied. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anyone who worked in there, but you still had to do your surveillances. Mm -hmm. So I went in with an RCT, and they had something that they needed to do. So they had gone through and checked all of the extinguishers and marked them that they had checked them, and they told me that they were going to leave. Well, I had lost, you know, time, and I hadn't realized it, and it happened to be that I became, they forgot that I was in there, and the new shift had not come on yet for the evening shift, so I was stuck in the building, and technically, you you were not supposed to you know, survey yourself out mm -hmm. at that time. That was before self-surveil. -surve and so I was stuck in the building, and even the, they had phones in the back. But I kept calling the RCT uh, phone, and no one would answer. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't quite sure how I was going to get out of the building and follow all of the procedures on there. But I finally resolved the, the problem got out. They, Did you self-surveil? No, I was getting close to it, but I finally reached uh, RCT, and he came over from another building and surveyed me out on there. But I, I was getting real close because it was late at night, and I wanted to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, did, did, were you nervous uh, um, at first going into the hot buildings, or was that an easy transition? We're nervous because we were new. We were, did not have established the comfort factor, and had to learn to read all the postings and all the warning signs and so forth, and be sure that we knew that the areas that those postings applied to. And sometimes that was a little confusing, um, or than anything, it just slowed us down mm -hmm. because we wanted to be double check ourselves, be sure we knew exactly what we were doing. But once um, you, you got that comfort factor, having been through the buildings and so forth, and it was pretty routine. You just did not take anything for granted because you may have been in a, a room or a building uh, yesterday and been posted a certain way, and coming today it could be posted differently. So you, you just uh, get very good at reading every sign every every time you go in. Procedures were very important, and you know if it was a procedure that you uh, did step for step you did it step for step. Mm -hmm. If it was a procedure that you could use your knowledge, then you used your knowledge. But the thing was to follow procedures, look at your postings, and if you were careful, I felt very safe at the flats. I feel I was safer inside those gates a lot of times than I was on the outside of the gates. As long as you, you know, were careful and followed the rules and they were in your best interest. Mm -hmm. 
was a safe place to work. And you thought it operated safely? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Very much so. The biggest thing is the public perception of the safety out there and what we did versus the reality mm -hmm. was, was always a challenge. People seemed to always have a negative perception of what was going on out there. Uh, whether it was a public relations problem or, or what, I really don't know. But um, it was a very safe place to work. Mm. Um, how often did you um, visit each room? Like, did you, you know, have a, a week on one building, then a week on the next building, or what was your schedule? It depend upon the nature of the responsibility of surveillance at least once a year because what we had to do in going through the buildings was being sure that the hazards had not changed for the fire protection that was afforded to that area. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through and be sure that um, the fire protection uh, prevention activities were appropriate. Mm -hmm. So that meant that at least once per year we had to travel through every building. Mm -hmm. and every room. There were other surveillances, other responsibilities where we'd go through once a month for a particular hazard area. So it varied. And um, when you went in, did you work off of as builts or did you, how, how did you know like what room to go in where initially or did you? Just kind of searched it out on our own. It's one of those things that uh, when you do fire extinguishers and that sort of thing, you know you have to go into every room uh -huh. and that sort of thing. So you start either at the bottom or the top and you just work your way totally through that the facility. And many times you'd talk to the um, the manager of the building and they would let you know if you missed something and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The building emergency support team, one of their jobs was to do monthly inspections of all of the extinguishers. Mm -hmm. And if you missed something, they would tell you. And because we were so it worked so closely with them, you know, you'd say, well, gee, I didn't see that one. They would come and they would take you to where it was. You know, so if you hadn't found one and they had seen that you hadn't done your annual, they would get you to where you needed to go. The, the team was very good at, and very helpful, you know, to us. Or if you found that there was a process being performed, a production process, or a, a we not sure we understood what was happening or understood the hazards. We'd get all the best team members mm -hmm. and have them go with us and explain to us what was taking place or what they interpreted the hazards to be mm -hmm. so that we could then evaluate it and determine whether our fire protection and fire prevention uh, practices were appropriate. So it a good team effort. Um. So you didn't have maps of the buildings then or anything to work on? There were maps available, floor plans available, uh -huh. but it was more cumbersome to try to follow those than just to, to walk your way through and learn by experience. That worked out much better in the mind than trying to uh, follow. And the, things were constantly changing. The rooms were constantly being remodeled, processes were being moved. So we found that the as belts were tend to be out of date. And fire prevention would try to update our our fire prevention floor plans. We had what three large books, four large books. I can't remember that you know had floor plans of all the buildings. Mm -hmm. But it was so hard to to keep with, up with those that our computer printout and numbering system became more useful to us that, oh gee, I missed, you know, number six, you know, and go back and look at the description of where number six was supposed to be, then going by a drawing. The drawings were cumbersome, and you didn't want to take anything more with you in the back than you had to, mm -hmm. you know, and these books were about like so, you know, and you didn't want to carry that around. You want, you know, once you had your tools, your respirator and all that, the things you needed to take with you, you didn't want to take any more equipment on there. Huh. Um, so just, so I, I think I might have missed something in your chronology. You, so you got there in 89. No, we, we oh. arrived in 93. 93, okay, 93. And, oh, and you started, you... you but we, were, as a contractor, okay. we started... Uh, Around 88, 89. 
in that area. All right, so you arrived in 93, and then um, sounds like, Alice, your job changed. Did both of your jobs change? We did fire equipment for about two years, and then I went into the fire department as a training officer mm -hmm. and became the uh, program manager for the best team mm -hmm. and did training and that sort of thing. Tell me again what the best team is. Building the emergency support team. Okay. They're a group of volunteers that work in the buildings mm -hmm. that respond to an emergency to try to contain it at the point until the fire department can come in and, and go from there. Okay. Uh, the EGG adopted the change in philosophy site-wide. Mm -hmm. They totally restructured almost every department on, on site. Mm -hmm. um, and the fire department had started out being its own entity, had expanded, as we explained earlier, to include uh, Fire Prevention Bureau, Special System to Hazards, which Alice and I were responsible for, and so forth. Did that for about two years, and then for some reason, EG&G &G decided that they wanted to restructure the fire department and wanted to have, a sep have the fire prevention separate from the fire department. Unknown reason why they wanted to do that because it was working very well before. Well, when they then started separating us, Alice went with one group with the best team and I went with the uh, fire prevention group and inspections and service of, of the fire prevention systems. Mm -hmm. So we then were separated and uh, remained that way for a number of years. And then um, about, what, eight years ago, no, about six years ago, um, I then transferred back into the fire department in the uh, communications divisions as, as dispatchers and the 911 operators, mm -hmm. to 911 operators, and alarm monitoring central station out of the Emergency Operations Center, the EOC in Building 115. So we still continue to work uh, both for the fire department but in totally separate uh, functions. At that time they then outsourced uh, under subcontract all the uh, work with the uh, systems and fire extinguishers. And I did not remain with that, that subcontract. I went back to the fire department. So they that was the work you were initially doing then, and then they outsourced it again? Yes. Yeah, it was one of those things that when we were doing work for them, when we owned our company, they, uh, it had to be all done in-house, and then about two years after we went with them, they decided to contract it outside. <laughs> but we'd already sold our company by then. Uh, um, so now, Ron, are you still working there? I'm still time? with the fire department. Okay. Uh, still working in the communications, the emergency operations center. I'll be there in sometime uh, mid-October, and then I'll be leaving uh, at that time. And Alice, when you left? I left April 1st, 2003. Oh, okay. just recently. And then I 2003. go... 2003. Right. 2003. And then I work one day a month. I still do training for the best team. Mm -hmm. So I go out one day a month and do best team training. And then... Um, High Country Fire Equipment, who I have a partnership with. Mm -hmm. uh, we service all of their SCBAs for the fire department in the building. Self-contained breathing apparatus. The government has its own little language, yeah. you know. But uh, so we service the self-contained breathing apparatus to make sure it meets its uh, standards, you know, for NFPA and that's and that's. And then we do a lot of fit testing for the subcontractors. The site used to provide all fit testing for all personnel on site, mm -hmm. but when they went to the subcontractor uh, concept, they diminished what uh, support they will provide the subcontractors. So we, uh, s we are a contractor to the subcontractors for fit testing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking through my... Um, well, I guess I wanted to ask, Alice, do you miss working out there? I miss the people. Uh -huh. uh, you meet, you know, a lot of very nice people, and uh, I do miss, you know, seeing a lot of the people and that sort of thing. It's very interesting to watch the buildings come down. Uh, being out there only one day a month, you can't believe what's happened from one 
one time to the next time on it and uh, so the changes are quite dramatic on it and it's in some ways it's kind of sad uh -huh. because um, it, before when we first started working there it was a family and and everybody was very very close to each other now it's several little businesses mm -hmm. and uh, they don't have the family type feeling that you had before mm -hmm. yeah but I still have a lot of friends out there and it's you know it's good to go out every once in a while so in terms of chronology um, you got there after the FBI raid correct mm -hmm. and um, were you subcontracting after the FBI raid or? yes okay. and um, were you there after they announced this that um, they were going to stop production Yes, we were there at that time. We were employees of the fire department at that time. It, uh, when they announced that they were going to uh, D&D the facility. And how, yeah. how, how did that affect you guys? Or how, how did it make you feel? I didn't believe it. Um, I, based on what I'd read before and what I'd seen, I did not believe that um, they could uh, dismantle, decontaminate, dismantle the facility and tear it down in uh, my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So it didn't bother me because I felt I had a job out there uh, as long <laughs> as I wanted one. And uh, based on procedures and so forth, I just didn't see how it would happen. And second thing is I didn't know why. Uh, I felt that uh, the site provided a vital function for DOD. And so I, I, to this day, don't understand why they are taking the facility down and wanting to transfer or build another facility somewhere else to do the same thing we were doing before at many billions of dollars more. So, uh, you know, I don't understand if it's politics or, or what. So I didn't, didn't believe it. Uh, Got to give Kaiser Hill credit that they through their uh, management philosophies and so forth, uh, have done remarkable things in developing technologies, for, you know, to to tear the buildings down. Mm -hmm. And I think they yeah. will will achieve it on on schedule. I agree. You know, you you think of these buildings that are uh, reinforced buildings. You know that they you know would be very very difficult to come down, but they're they're doing it, and I think they're going to do it on time. The and ability to decontaminate, I thought, was always going to be uh, forever an obstacle. And uh, through the various processes and innovations and trials and errors, they've come up with ways to decontaminate. The other thing is the places to take um, waste. Mm -hmm. uh, I never thought they had the receiver sites that would be willing to take our waste. And they've come up with ways to, to package it and transport it to the receiver sites. I think those are the two key elements to their, to their success. Mm -hmm. But yeah. like Alice... Oh, go, go ahead. But, Alice, <laughs> but Alice has said, that it, it, the, what has been lost is there's not the dedication to the employees, there's not the interest to maintain a long-term employer-employee relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a, contra a contractor, uh, employee type, uh, short-term relationship. and So that's sad. And the people that are working on site now that, that we're doing fit testing for come, they, they're used to going from one nuclear site to another nuclear site to another, another nuclear site. Mm -hmm. They may have worked in a nuclear power uh, situation before and now they're at Rocky Flats. They don't have the dedication to the facility that the others do, but they're used to moving around and uh, come and from all from over. From job site to job site. Right. It's the new paradigm. Huh? Right. Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop and not put in any tape, so. Project. My name is Hannah Nordhaus. It's the 20th of August, 2004, and I'm at Alice and Ron Brace's house in Lakewood with Alice and Ron Brace. Um, so we're just sort of wrapping up here, but um, you were talking about the um, ceasing of production and the D&D &D project, um, or the D&D &D process. And um, one thing, and, and we're talking about getting rid of all these materials and how you didn't think it could be done, and it's being done. Um, 
Do you think that that site can be truly cleaned up? Do you think it's going to, you know, be a wildlife refuge where you would be comfortable your kids play? As I understand the plan, they're going to keep about 300 acres where the main is uh, kind of a no man's zone area mm -hmm. and the rest of it will be opened up to the the historical park, and I think that would probably be safe on it. I have a, a difference of opinion in that um, I believe there's going to be two phases. One is the D&Ds we see now where the buildings come down. I am disappointed that uh, things that are infrastructure that was underground uh, whether mm -hmm. it is uh, waste storage areas or whether it's pipelines uh, whatever that the things that are deep underground are not being attended to mm -hmm. my understanding and this is strictly hearsay is that once the buildings come down then a few years after that they're going to have another project come in and really deal with the analysis and uh, if necessary clean up of things that are deeper underground I still think there's a lot of things that uh, need to be researched and uh, I have a concern that they're going to end up broadening uh, dramatically the exclusion area to where you know you will not have uh, walking trails or bicycling, bicycle trails or anything like that where it will be uh, excluded from uh, people, the public entering it. There will be a significant area that will be, you know, I think should be open to the public, but I think uh, the they're talking 300 to 500 acres uh, will be uh, exclusion area. I think it may be uh, necessary to make it much larger. So they're, are they're not decontaminating the stuff down there? They're doing the best they can, but they're, you know, I don't know what kind of testing that they're doing for some of the uh, process lines and that sort of thing. On it. So this is stuff, these aren't the underground buildings, but ducks and stuff underground or? Pipes and so forth and, yeah. and I base my knowledge or my concern on having talked with people who worked out there and said well we had this process line break and we fixed it and so forth and uh, or we had this process line that was leaking and uh, I'm just hopeful that uh, Kaiser Hill and the Department of Energy will spend the necessary resources to be sure that everything that's underground that has to be there to support a small city uh, gets evaluated mm -hmm. sufficiently to say that uh, we don't have a contamination problem or we don't have a migration of uh, waste problem uh, because uh, I think everybody's been surprised over the years of how much waste has migrated with groundwater and so forth and I know they're sensitive to it I just hope they uh, devote enough time and energy and funding to, to be sure that the whole area is is uh, cleaned up. So you say that's the phase two that that's going to be part. Of that's the my impression. Is that's yeah, kind of phase yeah. two. That's a little mm -hmm. scary, <laughs> or you know, a little eyebrow raising. Um, you had uh, you just mentioned Kaiser Hill. Uh, you you got there during the EG and G years, right? Mm -hmm. Or I guess you were there for a little bit of Rockwell as well. No, no the EG and G. Um, can you tell me uh, the the difference that you see between those two companies and the environment that they've fostered? Take it. <laughs> E.G. G. G w was brought in with the concept of the nuclear navy policies and procedures, everything very, very formalized. Mm -hmm. The nuclear navy concept, which works very well in the nuclear navy days. Um, it was a total cultural change. It slowed down everything that we were trying to do out there. Conduct of operations, uh, procedures, uh, m more formalized and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, the, con the attitudes it divided the employees from management because it, the, as employees we felt management did not trust us, did not believe us. Uh, hadn't, didn't rely on our expertise and, and really didn't involve us. Mm -hmm. So there was, became kind of a division there. And also it was very frustrating to do things um, that used to take, you know, an hour or two, now it would take two or three days mm -hmm. by following the procedures. 
procedures got many times got in the way. Um, so after that, then ENG uh, was replaced with DynCorp, and things became a little less formalized. It started to divide out those things that needed to be proceduralized versus those things that did not need to be proceduralized. Mm -hmm. And you could see a big change then start to take place that uh, there was making, they were making a distinction of to wh what could be done under what method. Then shortly after that, then uh, Kaiser Hill came in mm -hmm. and was brought in to, for the sole purpose of uh, uh, deeming the facility. And initially, De Kaiser Hill started out uh, uh, continuing what DynCorp had started, and that is to reduce the, the, the cumbersomeness of the procedures and only have them where, where necessary and rely on craft knowledge mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere. And then, uh, as things developed with Kaiser Hill and they got into the true uh, construction type mode of operation, uh, I've noticed where there's there's a big division between management employees again because um, it's a construction company in, in reality and the nature of the construction business is that there's no desire for long-term employer-employee relationships because they're coming in there for a short period of time doing what they need to do and going on to the next uh, construction site so there's not that dedication between employee, employer, and employer, employee. There's no loyalty or anything loyalty like that. Loyalty is not there. Mm -hmm. So once you understand that and accept that, uh, Kaiser Hill is a good company to work with, knowing that there is a transition of type of employee, employer relationship, mm -hmm. which was totally in contrast to what was there when we first arrived, which as we talked about was the long-term employee the dedication to uh, to the job and, and so forth. So the psychological aspect of the of the work environment has dramatically changed. Not necessarily wrong, but it has changed. And I think the um, purpose that they were there for has changed, you know, dramatically. E. G. and G. came in after the raid, and they were going. They were trying to make sure everything was proceduralized and every dot was dotted and every T was crossed sure. and they were and they were getting ready to go into production again right. and they were going through readiness, review, readiness reviews to get ready to produce mm -hmm. you know so they were being very very careful because they just had the raid and they wanted everything documented and documented well mm -hmm. and so it slowed things down but it was everything was done by procedure and, and documented where now documentation is not so much important. We're tearing things down, and it's a construction site mentality, and that's how it's worked. Mm -hmm. So they're totally different in the way their operations and their purposes and that sort of thing. But their their goals were different too. You think there's been any sacrifice of safety with the sort of construction mentality versus or safety or uh, safeguards or whatever? I think there has. Yeah. I think there has also. The, the stories I hear sometimes are, and, and I'm not there to witness it, so it's, you know, third-hand stories kind of thing, concerns you, you know, as to the safety. And sometimes you hear that the safety of the individual is not so much important as getting the job done. And, you know, specific stories even? And, no, and it, it's just one of those things that uh, coming from the safety field, and, and that sort of thing, you, you were worried and you are concerned for your friends because you're hearing these from your friends that you worked with mm -hmm. and uh, you you concern for their health. I don't think I can add much more to that other than to say that I generally believe the company wants people to be safe. They're not deliberately putting them in harm's way. Mm -hmm. But where the, the pressures are coming from they're schedule driven. We want you to do it safely, but you know it's got to be done by such and such a date or such and such time, and do whatever is necessary to be sure that's done by that date and time. And the consequences are severe if they're not. Mm -hmm. So as a result, sometimes safety has to be compromised in, in to achieve a schedule. 
and the fact that you've got so many different people working in the proximity doing different things to each other um, you may have four or five different crafts working in the same room in their same proximity and they're all doing their own thing and sometimes again they one craft doesn't want to or one company doesn't want to compromise their schedule because of another company's in the in the area or in the in their way or got there before they did so it's, sometimes you get some conflicts between companies as well as between workers and between crafts mm -hmm. and so I think that has created some safety issues and I think that's a normal construction attitude I know when we owned Adco Fire and uh, you were trying to get a restaurant up and going and you know you had the electricians we were there and everybody's trying to get everything done at once and you're time driven and sometimes you'd find your your power gone because the electrician needed it and the same kind of things going on in this construction mm -hmm. side because everybody's trying they've got a goal there's some nice rewards if they get it done on time and everybody's trying to get everything done and sometimes the safety steps are being skipped and what happens when people complain about it I, everything from the complaint is ignored to there's uh, employment consequences hmm. uh, some of the people I know say that if they complain they're moved to another building another job and then eventually out yeah well, there's such, so many layoffs going on that it's hard to... Hard to say you're being laid off because of this thing, but it, you know that, you know, if they're a complainer, there's chances are that they're more likely to leave than somebody else that isn't complaining. Um. So, Ron, um, how do you view the prospect of leaving your job of the last... I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I've enjoyed my job. Uh, worked with a great group of people. I've had uh, responsibility, uh, which I've enjoyed, but it's now time to move on. That uh, our job responsibilities are changing in the communications division, and so I'm looking forward to, to new challenges. I'm looking forward to working out in the real world, uh, away from the construction company, and uh, being able to establish close relationships with uh, my customers. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled. <laughs> Ron and I worked together for the first 20 some years of our lives, you know, 24 7. And when we, you know, we started out at Rocky Flats together, but then we were separated in doing different jobs and different hours. And Ron will be coming and working with Respirator True Fit, and we'll be working together 24 7 again and I'm looking forward to it. Um, Ron, you had said, uh, you'd mentioned that EG&G was a um, nuclear navy mentality, so it was more of a military, is that sort of where it, the, there's the people who make the decisions and I think top down? I think, as I interpret it, and my, it's my impression, is that in the nuclear navy, you have to have everything very proceduralized and very precise. And the reason for that is they're dealing with a lot of, a lot of hazards. Uh, they're dealing with a lot of lives involved. And they're dealing with a lot of employee turnover. Mm -hmm. um, in the nuclear navy, uh, you may not have this military person doing this same job for the next 20 years. It may be for the next two years, three years, or four years. And then you've got someone new coming in and doing that job. And because of the necessity of their missions, that job must be done the same way no matter who is doing it mm -hmm. because their jobs are all intertwined and so to have a successful naval or military mission there can be there has to be seamless transition between employees doing this doing the job and at Rocky Flats in particular you didn't have that turnover of employees Yes, you needed to have a operation that was done the same way consistently, mm -hmm. but there wasn't the vast differences between the jobs, mm -hmm. and you didn't have the turnover. So you had this, that person in, at Rocky Flats who had been doing that job 
a certain way mm -hmm. for 10, 15, 20 years, now is being told it, it will be done a certain way and it, he must use the same exact precise procedures no matter what and didn't allow him the flexibility to go to his superiors and say I've got an innovative way of doing this. They weren't interested in innovative, they were interested in the sameness and seamlessness mm -hmm. of the operation. So it took away the independence, it took away the ability to innovate and, and improve the, the job. And I think that may have returned after a number of years if we'd gone back into production. But they had to, EGG had to demonstrate to the oversight people that they were very much in control and they had their fingers on the pulse of the site. Mm -hmm. So as a result, uh, the nuclear Navy came in and really became a burden to, to the site mm -hmm. with implementing their procedures. And I think because of the difference in turnover personnel. And a lot of the people that were in the management positions did come out of the nuclear Navy yeah. on there. And, and that's how they managed and what they were used to. I've never heard anybody say anything particularly nice about EGNG. Um, it strikes me, I mean, was part of it that they people were, weren't really doing anything while they were there, right? I mean, there wasn't there wasn't a mission to, for D and D, and there wasn't a mission. There, the mission, I guess, was they were on standby. Yeah, and that must have been hard. Did you get that? Sense? I I think it was very hard. You know, the fire department we had plenty to do. Uh -huh. We had our our inspections, our procedures, and that sort of thing. So we were quite busy all the time, and of course. Our fire firefighters were state certified, and there's a whole bunch of things you have to do to be state certified firefighters. Mm -hmm. So we were busy and had things to do, but in the buildings, a lot of times, you know, uh, they played cards, they played, you know, dominoes, play. they they you know read books after books after books, you know, because they were there to do their job, but we hadn't started production yet, so they. You know, would do what was required for the day, and then a lot of times they, they sat. I remember, they weren't ready for us to start work when we first started in, and so we walked in there. Ron and I had all kinds of ideas of what we wanted to do, and they handed us the yellow pages and said, "Read these," you know, and that was our job was to read the yellow pages to keep us busy, until they were ready for us to go through all of our training that we had to go to before we could go into the buildings. In the fire service, it's difficult to proceduralize mm -hmm. because we're responding to an emergency medical situation. Not every medical situation can be handled the same. And so to say that you must proceduralize how you're going to handle it doesn't have application, but they felt compelled to do that because that was the way it was always done in the military. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, well, I guess that's few big wrap-up questions. Um, how did you both feel about working in a plant that produced a key part of nuclear weapons? I had a pride in it. I feel the people that produced those, you know, triggers were very proud of their workmanship and what they accomplished. Mm -hmm. I feel that having uh, weapons is very important to our country and I, I'm glad I've worked there. I've learned a lot uh, I learned a lot about me and the site and what was, you know, our country can do, and I was proud to work there. I, w I would agree, I would echo what Alice has said, mm -hmm. that having a nuclear weapons arsenal isn't necessary. I was in favor of that, and th I was proud to be uh, a part of that, and I was confident in our government that uh, the people in, in our government, as well as the politics, uh, would make uh, the use of nuclear weapons very unlikely, but it was a very valuable deterrent. Um, and, and so, and Ron, you had said that you, you don't see any reason why they needed to stop production at that site at all. Correct. Um, I, from my understanding of nuclear weapons, the technology is there is an ongoing need for nuclear weapons and for the weapons to be serviced and the technology of nuclear weapons and so forth and their components still needs to to go on in research and I feel that that probably is going on in a very limited scale elsewhere I don't know for a fact but I would suspect and 
I thought we had the personnel, the scientists, the production people, we had the facilities and the, the experience expertise. that made it a very likely, a very good candidate to continue that acti those activities. And I, I, to this day, do not understand why they are talking about uh, building a multi-billion dollar plant somewhere else uh, that will be a production facility or a service facility and why they then did transfer some of the work to other facilities and had to hire and build facilities elsewhere to do what we were doing. Even with the growth of the population in the front range you think it was... I think that's part of the public relations problem that the site has, uh -huh. had and does have, is I think the site was operated very safely. It does need oversight. Oversight is, is, is appropriate. But I felt that uh, uh, with maybe more public uh, stakeholder involvement, mm -hmm. and uh, we could, uh, could fulfill that role, fulfill it safely, to where we do not uh, necessarily jeopardize uh, the communities. Society grows. I think in, you know, before they came out for dumping issues, and I don't think uh, Rocky Flats was the only one that was dumping. You know, as, as, you know, I read through my hazmat books, you know, a lot of major industrial companies dump their waste in streams and things like that. Rocky Flats wasn't that bad mm -hmm. on there. But they learned, they learned what they were doing wrong and they were changing those things. Mm -hmm. I don't think Rocky Flats was a threat to downtown Denver. Mm -hmm. They never had an accident on there. The perception did not match reality. Um, well, the 60 minute fire was an accident, right? It was contained, nothing was released. Um, it was handled, you know, what well. What about um, the other thing I've heard is people say that um, the facility had, uh, was so old that it made sense to scrap it from that perspective because it was you know, a 50 year old facility trying to do state of the art stuff. You, you, you people are probably in a great position to see that. I don't agree with it. I think that uh, a lot of the facilities were newer and uh, that the structures, you know, 50 years old on some of them um, were still very, very well intact. Mm -hmm. And that those facilities that did have questionable marginal construction uh, integrity were not being used for processes that they should not have been used. They were for. risky. Yeah. They were risky. And I think that um, yeah, there, there needed to be improvements. Yes, there were things that I think were going on that should not have been going on in terms of waste mm -hmm. handling. But the technology also was not there and the funding was not there. Mm -hmm. If there had been appropriate funding and dedication to how to handle waste, expertise brought in to give guidance to how to handle waste, I don't think we would have had the problems that we had. That we had the problems, we should have faced up to them, dealt with them, implement new technology and go forward and, and be a, a good partner in our community. And, and buildings and processes can grow mm -hmm. and, and change and you know uh, we can rebuild our houses we can you know this sort of thing. So main, maintenance and keeping up with you know work I believe is probably a lot less expensive than going out and building a totally new facility. Not there. That changes with the times, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> I don't think when they, uh, when they shut down Rocky Flats, they weren't talking about that, but now they are. Yeah. Now they are. So, um, anything else? Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Yeah. Thank you uh, for participating. I really appreciate it. Great interview. Um,